talk through a little bit about um, what's been going on with regard to the campaign and COVID-19, because I don't think we talked since the pandemic really yeah. got as serious as it has been. And, you know, in a state like Florida, which is really dealing with this um, more so than other states, how has that affected campaigning? Because you're a grassroots candidate and, you know, knocking on doors, this is kind of like the lifeblood of what you do and what, you know, activists like you do. How have you been able to adapt? I mean, I'm sure that there's been some growing pains, but I mean, what's it been like to campaign in the COVID era? Yeah, so there's no campaigning during a pandemic 101 type of book that has been able to sort of help a lot of these grassroots campaigns. And yeah, you're right. I mean, grassroots campaigns, Um, We are based on canvassing and door to door. And, you know, that's what we're about. And we were shut down for about a month and a half where we really didn't do any canvassing at all. We have an incredibly great social media um, presence. We have been doing our emails, phone banking, text banking. We're working on getting a mailer out this week. So, you know, we're doing as best we can, but a lot of those things, especially mailers, are really expensive. And that's something, of course, Debbie's going to be able to be blanketing the district. And she's sitting on over a million dollars just from this cycle, um, all corporate. And so, you know, we, we're hand to mouth. And so it's not as easy for us. But I think, that, and we have reinitiated um, so um, socially distant canvassing. So we do have canvassers. A lot of places that have vulnerable communities are just getting door hangers or just doing lit drops. And then we are having canvassers that are out there with masks and gloves. We do give out sanitizers. They knock on doors. They step back six feet um, and, you know, generally just do the best they can. And we're at least being able to put up yard signs. We're putting up signs. I mean, you know, we're, we're making the best of it, but, you know, it's not ideal. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, I'm really impressed with um, the way that campaigns, grassroots campaigns have adapted because, you know, the disadvantage that you have is that you don't take corporate money, but the advantage that you have is that you have this, you know, grassroots enthusiasm. So for that to kind of be taken away from you in a way, it's really, it's devastating. But I think that a lot of campaigns have been able to adapt and we're still seeing progressive success in spite of that. So I really am encouraged to see that. What I want to ask you about is um, COVID-19 relief. I'm assuming that this is going to be a thing until 2021. So let's say you're able to beat Debbie Wasserman Schultz and you make it into Congress. What would you be pushing for in terms of relief, uh, economically speaking? And what would you think would be the solutions that we would implement to actually stop the spread of the virus itself? Th- this has been, like I said, mishandled from start to finish. But I mean, you know, I was obviously much more in the thinking of payroll guarantees than unemployment. I obviously would have liked to see us, even if it was something like you guarantee 80% or whatever it was that they were able to do. Um, was that Canada or the UK? I mean, I know that other countries are handling this infinitely better than we are. But yeah, I mean, we're doing it purposefully to squash labor. I have no doubt about that. And the money is then being further funneled to the top 1%. We have seen the top corporate people earning billions and billions during this pandemic as almost like it's they're they're price gouging almost. It's they're really benefiting their the spoils of of something horrible. And it's it's really grotesque. And we're seeing it in live time. But this needed to be everything shut down, hard shut down and dealt with. And we needed to compensate people, whether it was through paycheck guarantees or universal basic income that needed to happen immediately. A twelve hundred dollar one time payment is a joke. We gave what a three trillion dollar slush fund to Steve Mnuchin is our, our, our like I don't even understand how people can sit in a meeting where that's brought up and not start laughing. Like, I don't understand how that ever made it to a table. Like, this is this is outrageous. So I would have taken that three trillion and stuck it at the bottom and let it funnel its way to the top. Yeah, you know, it's... people need that money. People need that money. People need a UBI right now more than ever. Rich people are making off like bandits, whereas, you know, the poor they don't know what to do. I mean, it was just the other day where CNBC released a headline that says 32% of households overall missed their July housing payment. The way that we've responded to this as a country, you know, like you said, it's been laughable in comparison with other countries. We've done the least for citizens. I mean, I didn't get my, you know, $1,200 payment until like mid-May. A lot of people I know still haven't received it in Oregon. I'm sure it's the same where you are. And a lot of people who 
you know, they own these small businesses. They don't necessarily know how to access the funds, you know, the small loans that were given to them. And now we see that Nancy Pelosi's husband, you know, Kanye West's business, they're getting, you know, these loans that are supposed to be guaranteed for small businesses. So, I mean, the response from our government has been laughable. So to have someone like you in there to at least be one more voice would have made a tremendous difference because, I mean, it really isn't that difficult. I think that there wouldn't have been as much of a pushback to the shutdown if we responded adequately to people's economic suffering, because I don't necessarily like, I know that it was easy to kind of like poke fun at the people who were doing these protests of, hey, I need a haircut and that's foolish. But like people who were against the shutdown, I think there was a huge economic component to this and they were really suffering and they didn't know how they were going to put food on the table. Um, and it's just, it's tragic to see, you know, and this isn't going to get better anytime soon and the virus is going to be with us for the foreseeable future so it's it's really grim and it, the one thing that i see as the silver lining is that this is kind of radicalizing people and it is leading to more progressive victories like Kara eastman in nebraska you know jamal bowman and mondaire jones in new york and maybe jen perlman in florida's 23rd congressional district against debbie wasserman schultz